the agreements in all senses, at all levels, or the mutual responsibility of the particular interactors. And the notion that listening is somehow passive or receptive to anything is essentially thrown out the window. It's just a different observer attributed role or aspect to what's going on. And as Heinz put it, and actually gave it a name, the hermeneutic principle, it is the hearer, not the speaker, who determines the meaning of an utterance. Yes? I'd just like to add a tiny little uh, side point that the photograph at the top on the left was the first time that Gordon has ever officially taught for more than the occasional lecture a program to design or architect he was teaching first-year architecture students in a two-week program that involved five psychologists talking about how we think and understand the world in 1976. My writing on top, past his come. Great. Oh, that's yours? Yeah. Great. Oh. I, write, I set that program up. So it was the first time he had done other than drop in as a, an invited lecturer. Was the beginning of his career as a teacher in architecture school. And that's it. Any questions, comments before we transition to Philip? In response to the last quote from Heights, this makes more sense to me. The meaning of an utterance is determined by a listener, which includes a speaker. Mm -hmm. If the conversation is recursive, then in effect the roles themselves circulate. Paul? This is a beautiful piece, Randy. Thank you very much for putting it all together. There's a tremendous amount here um, and a lot of implications floating through it. The first paper you mentioned of Rosenbluth, of uh, purpose, uh, paper, and teleology, you didn't note that that was co written by Wiener and. Uh, yeah, I did. Did you? It wasn't yeah. on the slide. Yeah. yeah, the, the paper. You, you feel like it was Rosenblatt's work or stimulus mostly? At first, I thought it was sort of a blend of the three. Mm -hmm. My current interpretation is that I don't think Wiener or Bigelow would have written that same paper. Mm -hmm. I think the emphasis on causality and purpose as a general theme in the philosophy of science, I think that was more or less pure Rosenblatt. You. Again, um, I think this is very different than anything I've ever experienced as a history, which reflects how much it is your history. It's just it's just a random cut. I mean, if, well, I, if I turned it's around... It's not an interpretation, it's construction. Mm. Yeah. Because it feels consistent to me. I, I feel more resonance than non-resonance. And, and the replacement, if I can use so strong a word and put it in Randy's mouth, a wiener at, as the center versus these other activities and people and ideas at the it's center, I think, I think is, feels more true to me, and it's more the story as I tell it as well in, in my own interpretation. And there, there are a lot of other people. If there's another figure that runs throughout the decades, there's a single figure one would point to as running throughout the decades from the 40s onward, it would be Bateson, and of course Philip's going to be telling us about Bateson. I would question that, say it would be me. <laughs> Good point. Which is why I generally avoided mentioning anything about Bateson except specific regard of participation. Yes. Thanks. I did that. I, I, didn't, I wanted to ask you if you had one line to say what cybernetics was, what would you say? Well, what is it to you? Well, I actually have an entry on the ASC website's page, and I don't even remember what I said at that point. Well, uh, actually, in the last couple of months, I've been playing with a different, call it understanding or labeling or wrapping, than I had used before. And that is that what differentiates something in terms of cybernetics versus anything else is not so much control per se or communication per se, but the notion that a trajectory of behavior is mediated by reference to something else. And the, by something else may be a separate component, uh, may be a separate entity or unit, may be an organ or component within the system of interest, 
or in the case of the nervous system, it is essentially virtual. It is in, or you might say, an orthogonal domain of interactions and behaviors. By orthogonal, I mean orthogonal to that in which the structure and operation of the system of interest is manifest. In other words, a sort of duality. That trajectory can originate in the same system? The, the trajectory behavior of the system being steered, I, I don't like to talk about steering and control and stuff like that, but I'll, I'll use it in this case. The particular system of interest that is whose behavior seems to be following a non-random path, so to speak. That non-random path is being mediated by something different than the operation being observed. It is in an orthogonal dimension or a separate, maybe a separate entity or subsystem itself whose dynamics are determining what that one is. But it's different. It's always different. That's this week's hypothesis. <laughs> and done. I want to uh, echo what Paul said, that was just wonderful.